prisoner of war, you must choose your words carefully when talking to an interrogator. I discovered a few weeks ago that it is even more important that you choose your words carefully when speaking with your wife. <laughs> My wife and I work very hard, typically until darkness literally falls upon the lawn. And when you do that a lot, there are times when you become grumpy. And we did. And after a period of time, my wife's eyes flashed in the dark, and she said to me, do you want supper? <laughs> I immediately began to reflect on the days I had been in Hanoi and all the meals I had missed. And I came up with what I considered to be a wonderful retort. So I turned to her, <clears throat> and in my southern drawl, I said, well, pilgrim, I want you to know that I can go 30 days without food. <laughs> Whereupon she smiled sinisterly and said, well, this will be one. <laughs> I went, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> I've got 12 to go and we can eat again. <laughs> that was funny. The American Vietnam prisoner of war experience is not a story about the plight of American POWs serving in the prison camps of Southeast Asia nearly so much as it is a revelation of the power of traditional American values. The most cherished value that we Americans hold in common is our love of liberty. Its birthplace was a Greek city-state of Sparta. Now Sparta, unlike its cousin Athens, was not known for its edifices and its monuments and its great works of art. Indeed, it left none of those things behind. It left much more. In 480 BC at the Battle of Thermopylae, King Leonidas and 300 Spartan warriors held back one million invading Persians for three days in a narrow mountain pass in one of history's most memorable last stands. In that one battle, Spartan warriors championed the right of all men to be free and laid the foundation for liberty. For nearly two and a half centuries, America and our our allies have been freedom's champions, and the sacrifice to safeguard the blessings of liberty continue to be secured by the shed blood of American warriors. So if you don't mind, I'm going to redirect the gratitude you've extended to me as a guest speaker to those of you who yourselves are deserving of special recognition. By taking the time to honor you, we will at the same time pay tribute to brave Americans and allies who are at this very moment answering freedom's call around this globe. So if you or any member of your immediate family has ever served in the defense of liberty, I would ask that you rise and remain standing. Come on up and let the applause begin, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. None know better than you. None know better than the combat veteran that the cost of freedom is high. But the blessings of liberty, priceless. But liberty is not just for Americans, our allies and friends. Liberty is a God-given natural right of all mankind. And that is why I believe the men and women serving in the armed forces of these United States today are living in a defining moment of history, hopefully 
Their generation shall witness the last great battles between the forces of evil, the forces of totalitarianism and freedom. Their challenge, of course, is global terrorism. And as you know, terrorists do not seek victory on a battlefield. Rather, they pursue their political objectives through fear and intimidation. They are a hidden enemy that attacks the innocent. And yes, they would prefer to use weapons of mass destruction. I share a belief with you, therefore, that the challenge for their generation is more difficult, it's more confusing, yes, more dangerous than ever before. I do have a purpose for my remarks. America's Vietnam prisoners of war quickly learned that the desperate, crushing environment of a POW camp can destroy the mind and the body, but it cannot touch the values of a good heart and spirit. Our ancestors understood this very well. As you know, they were a deeply religious people whose life journey was filled with great trial and tribulation as they fought to gain, and then they fought again and again to maintain America's liberty. They did not have the luxury to adopt a value system that felt good, was fashionable, but would surely fail them in tough times. They quite naturally sought the wisdom of the ages, which is carefully recorded in history and philosophy and religious doctrine to provide unto themselves and their nation the greatest opportunity to endure, indeed, to prosper. They then enshrined those values into our Constitution and our Bill of Rights values that gave birth to the greatest expansion of human freedom and prosperity in the modern age, values that beat on in the DNA of every American heart, longing to be reaffirmed. America's Vietnam prisoners of war walked into Hanoi with these values of our ancestors, and they brought us home with honor. Our experiences in Vietnam were precisely that kind of struggle, and I'm going to begin with a short video clip that shares with you how it looked in Hanoi. Torture has been defined as the application of pain so intense as to cause loss of consciousness or will. Much of the physical abuse begun by the North Vietnamese in late 1965 fits this definition. Often the prisoners would be forced to, in effect, torture themselves by being made to stand, sit, or kneel for unbearably extended periods. One prisoner was forced to lean against a wall from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. for six and one half days. Another sat on a stool without food or water for over three days. When a man passed out or feigned passing out, he was beaten back into position. The worst physical abuse, however, was that applied directly by the captor, whose favorite accessories were ropes, iron bars, and footstocks, which he combined in a variety of ways. Prisoners were frequently fastened by their ankles in stocks. Then their hands were handcuffed behind their backs and their arms bound together with rope from wrist to elbow. Then a longer rope could be run from the prisoner's arms around his body and through the iron bar at his feet to force him into a variety of trust positions depending on the strength and imagination of the guards. In one variation, the rope was tied to the prisoner's elbows and then tossed over a rafter so that the prisoner's entire body could be hoisted off the floor. In some cells, footstocks were used to secure the prisoner to his bed. It was a simple matter for the guards to turn these stocks into an even more rigorous instrument of torture. Floggings were another common form of torture prior to 1969. Prisoners were bound to tables or even trees and then beaten with bamboo sticks or thin strips of rubber cut from old truck tires until they lost consciousness. <laughs> 
In some floggings, the prisoner was lashed 800 to 1,000 times. Physical punishments like these were generally combined with isolation, denial of food and sleep, withholding of medical care, and general harassment. Throughout captivity, prisoners were subjected to interrogations, many conducted under the conditions shown here. In the early years of the war, the interrogators were mainly interested in military information, such as types of aircraft flown, combat tactics used, and types of weapons employed. In these years, however, interrogations were largely unsuccessful, owing to general ineptness at interrogation, the language barrier, and lack of familiarity with the U.S. military. Sign it. Then we will see that your arm is treated immediately. You know I can't do that. You are trying our patience, criminal. I've given you all the information. The greatest pressures, however, were usually reserved for efforts aimed at the extraction of propaganda statements. Although the prisoners were usually successful in evading answers to military questions, there was little opportunity to evade when confronted with a propaganda statement. The prisoner had only two choices, to sign or not to sign. The most extensive campaign of political extortion was initiated in mid-1966 when the Vietnamese began trying to extract written confessions of what they termed war crimes. Prisoners were pressured to confess and apologize for violations of North Vietnamese airspace and for alleged bombings of churches, schools, hospitals, and other civilian facilities. The POWs were likewise pressured to praise the good treatment being accorded them and to submit written requests for the forgiveness of the Vietnamese people. In the face of these threats, not a single POW chose to comply. Video clip provides you with a visual appreciation of the conditions and the environment of our internment. I'm going to amplify what you saw by answering three questions. Why all the brutality? What indeed were our greatest challenges? Why, how did we endure? To answer these questions, we need to consider these areas of interest. To understand the brutality, we must examine the political objectives of the North Vietnamese government for America's prisoners of war. To develop an appreciation of our greatest challenges, we must discuss physical, but especially psychological pressures of incarceration. And finally, to understand why, how we endured, we must talk about this thing called leadership in a rather strange environment, an environment of torture. So let's begin with that first question. Why all the brutality? Now, we can conveniently lump the North Vietnamese political objectives into these calendar frames. And in the 1964 time frame, the government of North Vietnam was not convinced that the United States was serious about its commitment to Southeast Asia. They thought there was a chance we might pack and go home. There are two things you need to know about this rather brief period of time. One, there was no torture. Two, from the day that our feet touched the soil of North Vietnam, the government of that land declared all of us as war criminals and summarily dismiss the benefits of the Geneva Conventions to which we were entitled as uniform armed combatants. It was that easy. For a nation that was a signatory to the 1954 Geneva Conventions which prescribed the proper treatment of prisoners of war to not only dismiss those benefits for American warriors, but to do so throughout the duration of the conflict. Things changed rapidly. In 1965, we entered into a period of what we call emotional exploitation of American POWs, a sudden, immature, emotional outburst on the part of the government of North Vietnam to involve us in their propaganda campaign to discredit the involvement of the United States in that region of the world. So, why the change? Because by now, the government of North Vietnam had become convinced that the United States was serious about its commitment 
that we weren't going to pack and run. So they reasoned it was high time that the American prisoners of war help to pay the rent. Now the objectives for this period of emotional exploitation, and this was true for all such periods of exploitation, were threefold. They wanted to know our military secrets. They wanted propaganda. And they wanted us, quote, to repent our crimes, unquote. America's Vietnam prisoners of war would agree that this latter objective, which we call the repentance objective, was a centerpiece of their exploitation efforts over the years. And it consisted of a systematic and continuous process of abuse and torture, which lasted for years. In terms of program facets, as was alluded to in the video clip, this period of emotional exploitation was kicked off with the Hanoi March. This march was held by the government of North Vietnam in an attempt to capture world public opinion to their side. But the march actually signaled the contempt of the North Vietnamese government for international law by illegally marching American prisoners through their streets, subjecting them to injury and possibly death. And it also ominously signaled the North Vietnamese government's intent to use American prisoners of war as a potentially new and powerful tool to develop propaganda to discredit the United States' involvement in Southeast Asia. These men were carried from this march directly to this camp, which we call the Briar Patch. There they were asked to fully support Hanoi's propaganda machine. Specifically, sign letters requesting amnesty, write letters requesting the forgiveness of the Vietnamese people, make movies, be on television, you name it. Ultimately, the men were tied to the trees you see in these courtyards and to various structural members of these buildings. And throughout the most intense 100 days of summer heat in North Vietnam, repeatedly and brutally tortured to force compliance. Let's talk results. No military information of any significance. Bunch of fairy tales for propaganda and 100% of the Americans walked into the torture chambers rather than to sign on the dotted line. The government of North Vietnam correctly reasoned that they had to do better than this. So in 1967, they entered into a period of what I called programmed exploitation of American POWs. They were trying to put their act together. Now, there were a variety of factors that drove them to the decision to create this period of program of exploitation. First of all, the propaganda that they did extract during their emotional exploitation tizzy backfired. The civilized nations of the world um, <coughs> were treated to a uh, so-called confession by a couple of American POWs. The North Vietnamese brutally tortured a naval flight crew, Nels Tanner and Ross Terry from California, to write a so-called confession claiming that they had been ordered by the highest authority in America to bomb the city of Hanoi, which was a lie. After repeated torture sessions, this naval flight crew wrote this so-called confession. The government of North Vietnam proudly packaged that confession and they sent it to the Bertrand Russell's War Crimes Tribunal, which was being held at that time in Europe. For those of you who may not be familiar with Lord Bertrand Russell, he was an infamous international philosopher who had banded together at that time with others of his ilk for the explicit purpose of branding the highest leaders in our nation as war crimes. At a public hearing, this so-called confession was read aloud. In the back of the room were United States reporters. 
The confession read something like this. Well, it's true. Nails and I were ordered by the highest authority in America to bomb the city of Hanoi. We were told to concentrate our bombs on old men and women and children and churches and pagodas. And the mission was so important. We were given as a flight leader, Superman. And we had Batman on the right wing and Robin in the slot. And those American reporters began to absolutely howl in laughter. They rolled out of their chairs, walked out of that farce of a conference, wrote their press releases something to the effect of, our men are really pulling one over on the North Vietnamese communists. And indeed, Nels and Ross had burned them badly. It didn't take Hanoi long to figure out what happened. And I remember the day they came into my cell block and they removed Nels and Ross from their individual solitary confinement cells. They took them to the torture chambers. And there those brave American heroes languished in and out of agony, not for a day or a month, but for the next two years of their life in retribution. Now the good news, those brave American heroes came home on their feet and they did all the rest of us an everlasting service by burning badly Hanoi's propaganda extraction machine. So the first reason for entering into this period of programmed exploitation was to fix the propaganda. It wasn't working. Second reason was a Hanoi march. It backfired. The civilized nations of the world took Hanoi to task for their mistreatment of American POWs and their disregard or international covenants. The third reason was the pace of the war. You history buffs in the room will recall in the summer of 1967, the air war in the skies over North Vietnam were heating up red hot. We were losing lots of aviators. The North Vietnamese government reasoned, perhaps in a swelling prisoner population, we can find some Americans who will voluntarily participate in our propaganda campaign to discredit their own land. But the most important reason for entering into this period of programmed exploitation was this. Hanoi stood in stark disbelief that all of the Americans would choose the torture chamber rather than to give them anything. They had to break our will to resist. They built this program to do so. Now the objectives remain pretty much the same. They still wanted our, to know our military secrets. They wanted propaganda, but they're looking for voluntary propaganda. And that systematic and continuous process of abuse and torture remained unchanged. There were three facets to this period of programmed exploitation. First of all, re-education. Break the American POW's will to resist. Find a weak American and exploit him to the max. Let's look at these. Re-education consisted of bombarding us with anti-war broadcasts, showering us with anti-war literature, reading, anti-war letters from two groups of Americans, Hollywood celebrities and politicians. Now, you can appreciate it when I share with you that not all of us were handling the trials and tribulations of POW life precisely the same. Some of us were walking on the thin edge of sanity. The camp authority read these letters over the camp radio system in an attempt to push those Americans who were having the greatest difficulty coping over the brink, causing them to become potentially unwitting tools of Hanoi's propaganda machine and possibly destroying their sense of self-worth and self-esteem in the process. Now you also need to know that for the vast majority of us, this re-education effort was a joke. They put two years of intense effort into it. It ultimately fell flat on its face for a lack of sophistication. 
Now we're talking about the three facets of this period of programmed exploitation, and the first one was to try and re-educate us. The second one was to break our will to resist. They wanted us, if you will, to surrender. The camp authority reasoned if we can force an American to surrender, then the American will readily participate in all future propaganda efforts to discredit his own land. If you're going to force someone to surrender, you have to apply some techniques to change their behavior. So the first thing that the camp authority did was to put us on notice. As, what the, as to what the rules of this game would be and what they expected of us. Here are the rules of the game they posted on our cell walls. Allow me to elaborate. What this says is, we're going to ask you piratical American airmen some questions. We'll tell you the format for the answer and what we want. If you don't give us what we want the way we want it, we're going to grant unto you something called strict punishment. Now everyone in this room, because you're so young, probably believe that politically correct speech was invented in the United States. You now know you were wrong. It was live and well, posted on our cell walls in the 1960s in the dungeons of North Vietnam. It has followed us home. It is a frightening thought. This does not mean that you will not be going to the square dance this weekend. It does mean you'll be making a trip to the torture chamber. So the first thing was to tell us, okay, here are the rules. Then they did more. As was alluded to in the video clip, they removed our senior leadership and they placed them in this special punishment camp we called Alcatraz. Then they did more. They systematically and brutally tortured every senior leader we had until they wrote a confession. One by one, they read these confessions over the camp radio system for everyone in an attempt to discredit our senior leadership and to demoralize the junior officers and NCOs. We ignored this. We knew precisely how it had been extracted. We were going through the same trials and tribulations ourselves. Now we're talking about techniques to try and break your will to resist. Another technique was the use of this. It was extraordinarily easy to make your way into the torture chambers of North Vietnam. But a major component of this effort was to try and destroy our POW communication system. The camp authority liked to say to us, we will sever your communication links and effective resistance will wither on the vine. Another technique was to attack your sense of self-worth or self-esteem. Here, for example, is an American clearly distraught over having signed this silly amnesty statement. The reasoning went something like this. If you can force an American to do that which he desperately does not want to do, the American will not have the heart to bounce back. Now you also need to know that America's Vietnam prisoners of war would agree that this rather sophisticated technique to try and break your will to resist was in our collective judgment certainly not dreamed up by the North Vietnamese camp authority. This had to have been a gift to them by the Chinese, the Soviets, or the Cubans, all of whom were more than well represented in and out of the camp systems of North Vietnam. They also implemented a selective and early release program. I draw your attention to the young man with the sling and the crutch who are not going home, who have a story to tell. Now we're talking about the three facets of this period of programmed exploitation. The first facet was to try and re-educate us. The second was to try and break our will to resist. And we just reviewed a variety of techniques that they used to try to make that happen. The third and the final facet and the ultimate objective of this entire program was to find the weak American. 
If a camp authority identified an American they perceived to be weak, that American was isolated, subjected to massive amounts of interrogation to extract as much propaganda as they possibly could. So clearly you did not want to be so perceived. Let's talk results. Again, no military information of any significance. And once again, the North Vietnamese had to resort to torture to extract propaganda. It was during this period of time they tortured Captain Jeremiah Denton, United States Navy. Later, Admiral Denton. Later, Senator Denton from the great state of Alabama. They brutally tortured Captain Denton to write and then read a so-called confession over Vietnamese television. As he did so, he took his eyes and in POW code, he began to blink one word over and over. And that word was torture, torture, torture. This was picked up by our intelligence community, publicized, and once again, the North Vietnamese government was badly burned for its clearly amateurish efforts to extract propaganda. How about the uh, selective and early release program? Did that demoralize us? No. Why not? Well, primarily because it was conducted outside the mainstream of POW life. We did not even know someone had been released for as much as a year after the fact. The most important question I'm going to ask, was the North Vietnamese government acting through its camp authority able to break the will of American prisoners of war to resist? And the answer is a resounding no. Our experiences confirm the words of the philosopher Bacon, who wrote, adversity doth best induce virtue, while luxury doth best induce vice. In other words, the more pressure they placed upon American POWs, the better we responded. In the 1970-73 time frame, we moved into an era of live and let live. Why? Well, first of all, in the summer of 1969, the International Red Cross roundly and soundly condemned the government of North Vietnam for its mistreatment of American POWs. In the fall of 1969, the history buffs in the room will again recall that the leader of the North Vietnamese government and people, Ho Chi Minh, died. America's Vietnam prisoners of war would agree that the cross we had to bear was Ho. He was a vindictive, miserable old man who could not take it out on Uncle Sam, so he took it out on America's prisoners of war. But the most important reason for moving into this era of live and let live was a massive letter writing campaign which was conducted by tens of millions of Americans and well-wishers worldwide who put the government of North Vietnam on notice that civilized society had had enough of their inhumanity and to stop it. Now think about it. Ho is dead. The government of North Vietnam has just been provided on a silver platter the opportunity to change policy. They did. It was dramatic. Let me add perspective with three questions. Was it ever in accordance with the Geneva Conventions? No. Did we ever see the Red Cross? No. Did we have Americans going legally blind for a lack of simple vitamins? Yes. So what was the reaction of the North Vietnamese to our departure? I'm standing in my prison cell one day, and my prison cell is in the central prison of Walla, which in turn is situated downtown Hanoi. I'm looking out the window, which is 15 feet in the air. I see this camouflage multi-engine cargo style aircraft droning through the skyscrapers in downtown Hanoi at low altitude. I reached over and pulled a Navy pilot friend of mine over and I said, George, what is that? And my buddy George looks up and he says, that is a United States Air Force C-130 Hercules aircraft. I put my arm around George. I said, George, you and I are fighter pilots. 
And we know the United States Air Force does not hire those C-130 flight crews for their navigational skills. <laughs> I said, but there's nobody shooting at that airplane. He said, something's up. Sure enough, within a week or so, they assembled all of us into the courtyard and they read the text of the peace agreement that had been negotiated by Henry Kissinger. And one of the conditions of the agreement was that it be read. And then all the officers and guards stood around to shake hands and let bygones be bygones. We, of course, ignored that, walked on back into our rooms and waited to go home. It was also at this time, for the very first time, that the camp authority began to recognize our senior leadership. And the chief interrogator, the cat, invited to a meeting Colonel Robbie Reisner, later living legend, United States Air Force General, Robbie Reisner, deceased last fall, never to be forgotten. The cat asked Reiser, he says, you must tell us, what are you going to tell the American people when you go home? Wish the general could be with us today and do his own talking as that big, deep, booming voice. But he said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We'll do something for you and your government. You have never done for America as prisoners of war. We will tell the truth. Nothing more, nothing less. You can count on us to tell the truth. Now, we have answered our first question, why all the brutality, by admittedly taking a rather abbreviated journey through the political objectives of the North Vietnamese government towards American prisoners. Let's turn our attention to the second question. What indeed were our greatest challenges? And let me say up front that the physical pressures were with us primarily in the early years. And the psychological dragons of incarceration did not raise their ugly heads until about the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh year you were there, depending on how you were anatomically put together between the years. But in terms of physical pressure, the number one pressure was torture. That systematic and continuous process of abuse was second. Solitary wasn't all that bad. We had so many clever communication techniques, it was like having private rooms. And the living conditions weren't great, but compared to the circumstances that uh, Americans and allied POWs had to face in the jungles of Southeast Asia, we were far better off. Now let's turn our attention to psychological pressures. The number one psychological pressure, bar none, was the constant threat of torture. It was always lurking just around the corner. For those of you who have possibly seen or may in the future some video or film footage of an American and a press conference in North Vietnam, let me share with you how the North Vietnamese communists orchestrated this charade. These individuals sitting at this table were given a set of questions they could read in sequence or they weren't at the table. They were partisans, in other words. This poor American was brutally tortured to memorize each of the answers in sequence. And these myrmidons were always standing immediately behind the screen as a grim reminder to the American as he walked out not to stray from the memorized answers. This was a deadly, bloody, serious business, and you did not want to be this American. Another psychological pressure is one we call removal. We had one American who was so brutally tortured, he completely lost touch with reality. The North Vietnamese camp authority refused to accept his psychotic circumstances. They called him the faker. We had to hold this young man down on a concrete bed twice a day. We cut off the airflow through his nose to force him to breathe through his mouth. We could then cram food down his throat to keep him alive. We were not about to let this young man perish while he was in our care. About two times a month, they would drag this poor man out tie him to a tree and beat him unmercifully, primarily with a rubber hose. They had one objective. They wanted him to open his mouth. 
and say anything. On one occasion, they hit this young man in the face with that rubber hose. And the remarkable thing about that incident was not the welt that it left around his face, but the fact that when he was struck, he never even blinked his eyes. This young man did not know who he was. He did not know where he was. And he was completely impervious to pain. And then one day they came, and they took him away. And he never came back. Never. Another psychological pressure was the fear of dishonoring yourself before your friends, your loved ones, your country. Between torture sessions, when no one's around, I made my way to an old desktop. As I gazed upon that desk, I saw a message that had been written by an American. You couldn't miss it. It had been permanently chiseled into the wood. And you certainly would never forget what it said. It read, may God and my country forgive me for what I have done. And my first reaction was to say to myself, what on earth could you have done? And then I realized, here was a young man that had created a set of standards and ideals for his life by which he intended to live. And in his judgment, he had failed to measure up. And in his grief, he had written this very public and chilling message of atonement. Boredom. A psychological pressure that on balance we handled very nicely. We were well educated, and when we weren't dodging the torture chambers, we spent endless hours sharing information on every topic from home construction to thermodynamics. At the end of the conflict, we had Americans pouring out of the dungeons of North Vietnam, returning to the universities all across this great America, taking the final exam in courses that expanded the science, the humanities, and arts, and receiving full credit, all of which they learned by placing their ear against a three-foot thick concrete wall tapping to each other in POW code. Never underestimate the power of the human spirit and never underestimate the power of knowledge. In front of our uh, cell block, we had a courtyard. In that courtyard, we had a cistern made of brick and mortar. It stood four foot tall. The hole at the top was three by three. You could fill it up with water and wash clothes. One very hot July summer day, we sat staring at that cistern, and we came up with an idea. So we stole a ruler from one of the interrogation rooms, and we found ourselves a stick, and we marked it off in metric units. We replaced the ruler so as not to be discovered. We then filled the cistern with water till it was running out the top. I stepped into the column of water and submerged. When my head went below the lid and the water quit running out, someone tapped me on my head and I slowly stood up. And I began to brush the water droplets off of my body and then as I was stepping out of the cistern, the door to the courtyard flies open. In comes the camp commander and a bunch of guards. Everybody is very excited. And the camp commander points at me and says, what on earth are you Americans up to? And I looked at him. And I said, we are weighing ourselves. He immediately adopted this confused, inscrutable look. He says, how can you do this? And I said, Archimedes. He says, who is this Archimedes? I says, I don't think I'm going to be able to explain it to you. <laughs> and about that time, my buddy comes running up with that stick. He puts it in the tank, and he measures the linear displacement of the water. He drops down on one knee and grabs a rock and he starts scribbling. Looks up at me and says, Bridger, 114. I turned to the camp commander and I said, look at us. When we shot down, weigh 170, 160, 150 US pounds. Now I weigh 114, we need food. He immediately adopts a look of understanding. He says, yes, I guess you, 114 US pounds. How did you do that? The Archimedes principle says a body immersed in a fluid is buoyed up with a force. 
equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. So if I take a 10,000 pound ship and go out here when the ice clears and we can see some water, <laughs> and we put that 10,000 pound ship on top of the water and start letting it sink, it's got to displace enough water to have the same force, i.e. the weight of the ship, going back the other way. So you can get your weight within a pound or so. There were two other psychological pressures. First of all, abandonment. We'd always privately agreed amongst ourselves the bombardment of North Vietnam would never terminate without us being released. And then one day, the bomb stopped falling. We were still there. It was also at this time, for the first time, that some of our men began to receive letters of divorce. Do you suppose the camp authority shared those over the camp radio? Of course. And the letters read pretty much the same. Dear Benjamin, it has been five long years, and the girls and I still do not know if you're even alive. I have had to make some horrible decisions. I have obtained a divorce. May God forgive me. Now, we're not pointing fingers at the government or the families. These were trying and difficult times for everyone. I'm sharing a little bit of the obvious with you. Under these kinds of circumstances, you can appreciate why some of our men began to feel terribly alone and abandoned. Now, the psychological pressure that bugged me personally the most, I was a single guy. I did not have the pressures of family. My greatest fear was contracting a contagious disease and either dying or becoming crippled before I could make it home. This was an extremely unhealthy environment in which to live. We lost great Americans in 48 hours with typhoid fever. Multiple interrogators dying of malaria. You needed to leave. Now let's turn to our final question. Why? How did we endure? Prior to 1970, the North Vietnamese government placed all of the Americans into individual, solitary confinement cells with a twofold purpose. They wanted to separate us from one another, our strength. And they wanted to provide unto their camp authority the opportunity to try and destroy our cultural bonds and heritage. Under these circumstances, as you would anticipate, spontaneous, covert communications erupted. These communications were difficult. They were very dangerous. And our senior leaders were oftentimes out of that communication loop for months, if not years, at a time. If we made contact with our senior leaders, we expected from them sound policy guidance, which oftentimes they had to provide on the spur of the moment. And then eventually, of course, as was alluded to in the video clip, they removed all of our senior leaders and placed them in that special punishment camp, and now we were left to fend for ourselves as individuals, as cellmates, and small groups of Americans. And yet we still successfully resisted the efforts of the North Vietnamese camp authority to exploit us. The question becomes why? An answer is provided by Colonel Galen Kramer, American Vietnam prisoner of war in front of mine, with what he calls his inverted resistance pyramid. Now in this pyramid you're about to see are a variety of reasons you might choose to resist exploitation. Some resisted because of their professional training, heroic acts of their friends, pride in country. And would you believe we had some Americans in North Vietnam who were absolutely terrific resistors because they were obstinate people. Does anybody know someone like that in here? These individuals did not want to be told what to do by their legitimate senior ranking officer or NCO. They darn sure didn't want to be told what to do by the camp authority. So what is the message? The message is this. If you happen to know someone in the armed forces or headed that way that you judge to be stubborn and pig-headed, these are the kinds of individuals that are appropriately nominated for the lead aircraft, the lead ship, or the point. They probably make a pretty decent POW. But there was one fundamental undergirding factor that buoyed up all others, and that was the unwillingness of the individual to sacrifice his own personal reputation. Now, one of the most extraordinary leaders we had in North Vietnam, exemplary gentleman, was Admiral James B. Stockdale, now deceased. This great American was a military strategist, a man of letters, 
He has written extensively on the subject of reputation or integrity, if you will. Let me share with you the wisdom of this great American. He wrote, integrity is one of those things too many Americans keep in the bottom drawer of their life, labeled too hard to do. He goes on, you can't buy integrity. You can't sell it. But it gives you something to hang on to when the winds of life begin to howl and you are faced with the tough choices of right and wrong all alone. Integrity is your moral compass. And if you give it up, recovery is not possible. Forgiveness is. Recovery is not. They are different. Integrity is therefore a preeminent moral value. It should be kept at the very top of every American's conscience. So this tells why we resisted. But how did we resist? Well, first of all, we did communicate. The camp authority never came close to severing our communication link. We also laughed a lot. I don't have to tell you folks that Americans have an incredible <coughs> sense of humor, but I have to tell almost all of you probably that my generation of Americans, we didn't have an incredible sense of humor. We had an incredibly morbid sense of humor. We would laugh at anything, and indeed we did. We laughed at the Vietnamese and we laughed at one another. Example. We had an interrogator we called the Elf because he was always passing out these witty little sayings we called Elfisms. I went to an interrogation one day with the Elf and I immediately began to complain about the lack of food and the medicine and the torture, which, by the way, whenever we went to an interrogation, we always complained about those things because they were always true. And the elf became irritated. He always did. So after my little speech, he points his finger in my face and he says, Cow, C-A-O. Cow is a Vietnamese word for bridge. You drive across them all the time. Bridge. My name's Bridger. I got to be cow. Now, you will never be able to forget me every time you go across a bridge. You're going to add an R and go, Bridger. I can't get him out of my head. That's the way you do it. You want to be remembered, you've got to come up with an, a, a technique. <laughs> we also laughed at one another. I had a roommate that was a kid you went to high school with that made straight A's. Well, this kid goes off to college, starts playing bridge. The courses are tougher, flunks out of school, ends up in the backseat of a Navy F-4 Phantom, is shot down and becomes my roommate. I have Einstein in my room. This kid is scary smart. They must have drug him out of the room two to three times a month while we were together and just beat the dick inside of him. So he had all of these emotional experiences. And when the conflict ended, he hot-footed back to college and became a doctor, a medical doctor. Do you suppose he wished he'd have done that sooner? <laughs> now, here's what you don't know about this nice young man. Very, 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 very clumsy. I think maybe rather than medical doctor, elephant vet would have worked better. <laughs> but I can prove my point. My roommate and I had a, a ritual that we played day by day for the time we were together. He had a compulsion. He'd walk around all day scrubbing his molars with this beat up toothbrush like this all day long. And he could only take two steps in a room. And this is what he did. I'd be watching ants or playing in my head. Well, he couldn't possibly accomplish this without dropping the toothbrush. Can you imagine what's on this floor? And so the ritual went something like this. He'd be scrubbing away. I'd be watching my ants, and I'd hear clink. And I'd look up, and he'd be looking down. And he'd look over, and he'd do the same thing every time. He'd look at me, and he'd, he'd say, give me the biggest grin. And he'd go, bristles are up. <laughs> so I couldn't keep right on going. <laughs> Never slow down. One day, he's brushing his teeth, his molars, over our bucket. B-O is Vietnamese for bucket. Lid is off bow. You know what's in bow. And it didn't clink, it's gurgle. <laughs> and I look up, and he's looking in the bow. You can't see very far. And I, I reached over, and I grabbed my toothbrush. I said, hey, 
He said, yep. I said, you see that? He said, yeah. I said, it will not sustain the two of us. Go get your stupid toothbrush. <laughs> so he rolls up his shirt sleeve about elbow high and starts groping around in bug. And I said, hey, how about it? Bristles up? He said, Barry, get your hand in here. Those dang bristles are up. <laughs> in other words, we laughed at a lot of crap is what I'm trying to tell you. Over the years, we fought an ongoing battle for the right to openly worship in our rooms. And every time we attempted this in the wee hours of the morning that followed, in came the stormtroopers to crush the religious rebellion. In the spring of 1971, in the central prison of Wallow, approximately 250 of us in our one, one two, and three-man rooms became engaged in an unplanned religious and patriotic revolt. In open defiance of the camp authority, we began to hold church services, share scriptures, and sing religious and patriotic songs. If you had been in Hanoi on that day, you would have heard those songs bouncing off of the buildings in the downtown part of the city, placed there by 250 strong American voices. True to form, in the wee hours of the morning that followed, in came the stormtroopers. They removed 36 of us. They considered to be troublemakers and instigators. They put us in trucks, took us across the city, dropped us into a punishment camp consisting of 36 individual solitary confinement cells. They were sending a message back to the men at the central prison. If you don't cease and desist this religious and patriotic revolt, you will receive some of the same. But on this occasion, under the leadership of Cag Stockdale and Colonel Ravi Reisner, the men put their heads together and said, you know, it's been a while since we've been engaged in a mass torture session. So why don't we push to test? So they kept on conducting church services, sharing scriptures and singing religious and patriotic songs. And the government of North Vietnam had a decision to make. And they did. After all of those years, they ordered the camp authority to back off. And we had finally won the right to openly worship in our rooms which, as you can imagine, became an immediate source of strength and unifying factor. As I've shared with you earlier, there are many individual reasons you might choose to resist exploitation. You can rest assured whichever one you would have selected would have been a derivative and would be a derivative of American culture, American virtue, American values, Christian values, thereby enduring values, gifts of our forebears, none of our making. These were the threads that made us unwilling to let one another down and ultimately victorious. When we had lost everything we possessed, we ended up with that which was profoundly the most important to have, and that was the good duty to care for one another. The lessons we learned in Vietnam were not new. They were profoundly instructed to us years ago by an 18th century German philosopher by the name of Wolfgang Goethe, who said, what you've inherited from your fathers, earn over for yourselves, or it will not be yours. I conclude my remarks by saying God bless you. God bless your families, and may God bless our USA. Thank you.